Okay, we're just going to see if this will give you a little bit of context. Um, now, the, um, this is a game I'm going to be talking about. Uh, it's available for free to um, play on the internet. Um, I wanted to hear a little bit of the wonderful theme song. Um, just to give it kind of uh, an effective flavour. I was going to let it sit there in the background. Um, yeah, so this paper is about um, a contemporary aspect of horror read through a contemporary read through contemporary philosophy, um, which isn't to say that it's kind of um, necessarily a kind of brand new kind of aspect of horror or even a brand new aspect of philosophy. But I think there's something about its kind of prevalence at the moment and the combination of these things that um, seems particularly relevant at the moment and is used to different effects than it might have done in the past. Um, so, yeah, this work um, that I'm examining is uh, by uh, Porpentine Charity Heartscape, um, whose biography lists her as a writer, games designer, and dead swamp milf in Oakland. Her work includes Xenofem uh, sci fi fantasy, cursed video games, and globe spanning sentient slime world. Um, the particular work that we're going to talk about today is one of her collaborations with the artist and game designer and musician Rook. The collaboration takes the form of the first of a series of self-produced episodic video games called No World Dreamers, Sticky Zeitgeist, Episode 1, uh, Hyperslime, which is the one that's up here. Um, my analysis of this artwork will be done through the philosophical tools of post-human feminism, and particularly those of philosopher Patricia McCormick, as presented in her book chapter, Lovecraft's Cosmic Ethics. It is in this chapter that McCormick proposes the use of Lovecraft within the post-human feminist project. Lovecraft's supposed aversion to the carnal, combined with his stories frequent, stories frequent encounters with overwhelming fleshy or cosmic imminence, allows him to be brought into the unlikely com um, company of philosopher Lucy Rigore. McCormick asks not for a revision, but a use of Lovecraft, querying his writing into an, ethically, an ethical erotics of alterity. I speculate that under this, Lovecraft's writing remains within the sphere of horror, though this sphere becomes even more heterogeneous. This reading of Lovecraft has already got a precedent in the work of philosopher Gilles Deleuze and psychoanalyst Felix Guattari, who see within his work a becoming animal, which is to say the breaking open of what a human is into a becoming's elementary, cellular, molecular, and even becoming's incomprehensible. What Deleuze and Guattari celebrate here is the replacing of a singular molar self with a pack, or in the words of Lovecraft's Carter, to be aware of existence and yet to know that one is no longer a, def a definite being distinguished from other beings. If becoming animal, merging and reconfiguring with other forms of being, kinship and sensation, are not pushed back in phobic disgust by horror, the question must be asked, horror for who? The word horror itself becomes slippery in these conditions. I use it to refer to the genre, the signifiers and indeed some of the sensations felt by actors within such narratives, as well as ours observing them. However, the thing that I bracket out from horror is the assumed ethical position that might privilege order, the majoritarian, and the phologocentric above a different speculation and affect. It is my proposal that Sticky Zeitgeist represents a similar horror which denies the human and displays the same different celebrating erotic possibilities which McCormick pulls from Lovecraft. I argue that Sticky Zeitgeist is horror, but that the majoritarian subject, the one that should be horrified, is absent. It is not a fan fiction reversal which pulls monsters into the foreground and makes them sympathetic by conforming to the majoritarian structures of power, power, value or morality, anthropomorphizing them in the process. Rather, sticky zeitgeist just doesn't care about these structures and forges its own. Firstly, we're going to establish some of the key concepts used by McCormick and then trace them through the work of sticky zeitgeist. The first of these is the A-human. And while this term has many applications, I'm going to start with an extract from McCormick's own recent definition in um, the uh, Rosie Bradiotti and uh, Maria Halavgada um, post-human glossary um, from, published this year. A human theory promotes catalyzing becomings other from the majoritarian or all-human privilege and renouncing the benefits of the Anthropocene. Method, methods for which include the use of all manifestations of art to form new terrains of apprehension of a world and encourage new ethical relations between entities. In this definition, the a-human is positioned within a radical animal rights discourse of abolitionism, which seeks to avoid what it sees as anthropocentric raising of an animal to human equivalence. 
rather than bringing the non-human into the human ethical sphere, which, which McCormick considers both impossible and necessarily non-consensual, the abolitionist position bases non-human rights upon the fact that it is, rather than what it is. More importantly for the subject of this paper, abolitionists are activists against all use of animals, acknowledging communication is faith in the human, so we can never know modes of non-human communication, and to do so is both hubris and materially detrimental to non-humans. This is perhaps the most crucial aspect of the non-human for our purposes. Differences, difference is to exist on its own terms, and the capturing action of communication is not required to acknowledge this difference. Now time to approach No World Dreamers, Sticky Zeitgeist, Episode 1, Hyperslime, which importantly begins with a theory of difference, including characters which might point to but are never captured by the myths of either animal or human. After the opening theme song, the episode is ep epigraphed with a quote, Make a 150-pound self-contained 3D person into a square mile thin pancake and you've got a slimy veneer of organic matter of no use to you or the observer puzzled by the thin, goopy drip man. Suburbias and exurbias are promoters of slime. This quote is attributed to Italian architect Paolo Soleri, whose concept of the arcology, of arcology low waste, high population density, self-sufficient vertical structures, runs, though mostly in a mutant form, through our narrative. Our story's first protagonist, Eva, considers the quote and posits that they themselves are even further dispersed. Trapped in a room and glued to a screen, they are hyper-slime. Eva's response to this realisation is to get high and masturbate and surf the internet, something which is itself one action under the glow, uh, which is itself renders one action under the glow of her network terminal. Eva pokes the drug girl chunks into her arsehole. Eva, uh, Eva comments on the impossibility of describing this drug data sex experience. If I wasn't experiencing this, I couldn't describe it, and I can't remember when I'm not experiencing it, what I'm not experiencing, hyperscope growths in my frontal lobe like, before being interrupted by a telephone call from work. The impossibility of language, which has already been brought up in the A-human's relation to the non-human, as posited by abolitionist animal rights activists, surfaces repeatedly in McCormick's discussion of A-humanity and Lovecraft's horror, where we are shown what is possible while still managing to show that it is unnameable. For McCormick, human language is the great annihilator of the potentialization of e expressivity and effect of entities that are not counted by the majoritarian human. But in the world of Lovecraft, such language is demonstrably powerless. Encounters with, uh, are beyond description, are left as such. The ethical term which is executed upon Lovecraft demonstrates the inadequacy of the word horror to account for such experience. Horror for some, the very opening of the world for others. Or as articulated by Lovecraft himself, fright becomes, uh, becomes pure awe, and what seemed blasphemously abnormal, now only ineffably majestic. Returning to Sticky Zeitgeist, the collapsing of self, sex, and connection is ecstatic. The message, the, uh, the message demanding she travels to work is the cue for Eva's horror. The world outside her room, which is described as the goblin's pit, is loaded with signs, both literally in the form of adverts for jobs and bands and fast food, but in the fixed overlay of time, behavior, and social relations. Eva's chance to pass invisibly into order relies on her getting her bus to work, while in constant fear of the drugs and saliva leaking into her underwear. The bus is late, and she's going to be late, and she falls into a panic attack. The panic attack is represented, as the game descends, into a gross, nonsense parody of the call and response rhythm game for Rapper the Rapper. Some of the lyrics which are in the game are, you snooze, you ooze, then you, then you ooze, and follow your holes. The abject, as Julie Kristeva describes, uh, that Julia Saylor describes as the place where meaning collapses is not simply the girl chunks uh, leaking from Eva, but also Eva herself. When she first sets out on her trip to work, she narrates, I exit the back of the house like shit. Eva is the remainder, an excess, who them, uh, is the remainder, an excess, who themselves cannot control either, the out, keep, either keep the outside in or keep it, um, or keep it out, but is in constantly a signified flight, which becomes impossible and traumatic within the unaccommodating and regimented parts of the world. As we continue to play the game, focused initially on the narrative of Eva, more signs of horror perpetuate. The first of these is the user interface, which frames the game with cables and wires and viscera weaving around it to form the screen, and a text hyperlink area, which brings to mind the mid-90s point-and-click adventure game Dark Sea with its graphics by H.R. Geiger. At the top, a ribbon cable, cable is plugged in 
through a smashed secondary screen or logo area, leaving only a few letters of the game's title read- read- readable. In Sticky Zeitgeist, as much as in Harpscape's other work, trash pervades. Everything is a remainder, including characters. Everything is an improvised hack, survival mixed with abandonment, and most importantly, um, not fully nameable. This extends to the characters themselves. Eva is only described as a girl, but her ears and nose suggest a dog or maybe a goat. It's implied that she's trans, but none of this is cause for elaboration to the audience. Other characters are equal, are display equal fluidity, maybe becoming robots, maybe becoming moths. Gender is explicit, though, as all are referred to with female, female pronouns. They are she, her, and often sisters. The remainder, to be in excess or, or less than names and categories, runs through love, Lovecraft in horror. The folk of In's mouth, the mercurial old ones themselves, or various landscapes <coughs> and objects and experiences. McCormick quotes Lisa Rigore, already constructed theoretical language does not speak the mute. The mix remains a remainder, the juicer of delirium and dereliction of wounds, sometimes of exhaustion. This connectivity, abjection, transgression is the stuff of horror, but is also the stuff of erotics and kinship. The two robot sisters in Sticky Zeitgeist sit together on a train. One, Agate, leans against the other, who narrates, She's in sleep mode. She spends most of her time there. Our brains make a lot of connections at really super hard, fast frequencies, hard to shut out with the bad connections. Everything reminds you of something else contaminated with information. The default state is poricity, leaky bodies. The sisters block out the communication of thought and meaning but retains that of touch. Later the sleeping, later, the sleeping sister will visit a 7-Eleven and watch the rotating honk dogs, re- remarking how nice it would be to re- be rotated. An empathetic encounter with convenience food. The character in Sticky Zeitgeist are non-human and they are not fixed as some kind of non-human. Any encounter is a becoming animal, as everything holds an effective charge or is a biological contaminant. As the player of the game, we're often unsure who we is, as the first person narrative flickers between characters, often without indication of who is speaking. We have to assume that we are all of the pack, while acknowledging that this pack is constantly in flux. What stands out is that the four characters are not presented in, as an isolationist group, as with the majority of narratives of, of survivor, survival. Their job is to travel out into a luscious swamp and salvage broken parts of downed satellites. And one character comments, I like to rub my face in the debris to make sure that all the radiation is getting the most direct access to my brain. The group is open and loving with one another in their fluidity, whilst also being open to difference in the world around them. To be changed by, uh, to, to be changed by it through drugs, radioactivity, hormone replacement therapy, or the beautiful leaky swamps they eventually head out into. How am I doing for time? I was going to tell you a bit about Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but I'm going to skip to the um, conclusion. Um, in uh, 2012's Post-Human Ethics, Embodiment and Cultural Theory, McCormick states that the art encounter elucidates the new horror and wonder of being in the A-signified world as a new state of constant ecstasy. Engaging with art, including, or perhaps especially with horror, is not purely about representing alterity, but an effective encounter which breaks open the category of human. This is the argument McCormick makes for the ecstatic experiences of the, of the characters in Lovecraft's works, as well as our reader experience of those works of art. As we find ourselves adrift in a signification, we are becoming a human. I conclude that Sticky Zeitgeist presents the ethical polarity that arguably the works of Lovecraft must be made in order to extract. Sticky Zeitgeist presents a kind of horror which is not. Bodily, cognitive and social difference are not presented as needing hygienic eradication, but simply are. Characters might experience violent trauma and live in a world of unpredictable trash, but there is neither a call to order nor a dialectical refusal of order. What is valuable about this kind of horror is it neither exoticizes difference nor pulls into the ethics of the human. McCorthick states that the ethics of the art encounter shows becoming a human as viable and necessary for new ways of thinking or terrorism in the realities of life for oppressed subhuman subjects. Sticky Zeitgeist does exactly that, by querying a queering of horror to remove the human empire.